The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Our country is facing a crisis at the moment, actually many, and one of them is a crisis of unbelief, and it's been brewing for a long time. According to Gallup, this year, as you might have heard, the proportion of Americans who consider themselves members of a church or synagogue or mosque has dropped below 50% for the first time, continuing a long downward trend. Gallup first asked the question in 1937 when membership was at 73%. Now it's at 47. There's actually one religious group in America that is steadily growing. It's not the Baptists. It's not the Mormons. It's not the Muslims. It's the nuns. Now, if you're thinking of pious praying women in black robes, that might sound pretty good, but that's not what the nuns are. These are the people who check none of the above when surveyed about religious affiliation. At 26% of the population now, that's America's largest religious group. Now, part of the numbers, I'm sure, reflect the loss of institutional loyalty to churches, but not much. Those who regard religion as important in the survey is also at a record low. We live in an era of declining faith in the Western world. Jesus pondered in Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I ask myself the same. Today's gospel is a wonderful passage about moving from unbelief to belief, about moving from doubt to faith. There are so many good things to talk about in this passage. You have to kind of pick and choose year by year. And this year I wanted to say a few words about doubt. Although that may turn out to be harder than I thought it would be. What is doubt exactly? I had a hard time finding anything about it in all my reference materials. When there was an entry on doubt, it was usually a juridical term. You know, the, a doubt about whether someone has a valid marriage or something like that. 
One thing we must keep in mind is how even the close disciples of Jesus struggled to come to faith in him as the Messiah. Jesus kept giving them, you notice, examples of faith from the most unlikely sources. This Samaritan woman, or a little child, or a centurion. Five times in Matthew's Gospel, five times, Jesus commiserated over them, O ye of little faith, why do you doubt? When addressing their anxiety, when rebuking the stormy sea, when catching Peter as he sank beneath the waves, when they were out of bread, when they couldn't exercise demons, Jesus shook his head and said, O ye of little faith. Even at the ascension, when Jesus gave the great commission to spread the gospel throughout the world as his chosen witnesses, Matthew records that, quote, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Apparently, the disciples recognized the problem, too. In Luke's gospel, when they face the enormous challenge of forgiveness without end, they say to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. And he responded with the parable of the mustard seed. You know, if you just have a little bit of faith, you can move mountains. That Easter Sunday, when the apostles were gathered in fear, word started to trickle in that Jesus was alive. And these were not reports from strangers, but from trusted companions. Mary Magdalene herself told them that she saw that Jesus was alive, not just saw him, but interacted with him. Mark reports in his gospel, but when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country, and they came back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterward, Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves as they sat at table, and he abraded them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. How could we be surprised that Thomas, who was absent, would say, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Of course he doubted. They all doubted. One thing we need to realize is that faith and understanding are two different things, though people often conflate the two. Faith seeking understanding was the epistemological method stressed by St. Augustine when it came to how do you know God? And faith seeking understanding became the motto of another doctor of the church, St. Anselm of Canterbury. In our rationalist culture, we tend to think that knowledge or science has to lead to our trust and willingness to take actions upon it. But this is never really how it works, as Anselm explained. Chronologically, faith always precedes understanding, as when small children first trust their parents and believe what they say. It's only later, when they grow up, that they want to examine, perhaps, and understand the reality for themselves. We place our faith in things we don't understand all day long. I call my smartphone my magic phone. So that's basically how it works. You know, you just touch it and it does things. I turn on the lights. I don't know how electricity works. I don't know how an electric motor works. But I know if you plug it in and you turn it on, it does. We place our faith in things we don't understand all the time. For a lot of things, hey, I'm fine with that. I don't need to know how everything works. I don't have to be able to wrap my brain around all the elements of my world in order to enjoy life. But for knowledge of God, we long to be able to fully understand, even as we have been fully understood. And faith beckons us to explore divine mystery. Faith still, though, has to come first. 
We don't have to be able to explain God, to be able to love him, to commune with him, to obey him. But we want the understanding too, because you want to understand the people you love. On the other hand, we don't love them only because we understand them. In the words of St. Anselm, I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but rather I believe in order that I may understand. In describing his own faith journey in his Apologia, John Henry Newman put it this way in chapter 5, many persons are very sensitive of the difficulties of religion. I'm as sensitive as any one of them, but I've never been able to see a connection between apprehending those difficulties, however keenly, and multiplying them to any extent and on the other hand, doubting the doctrines to which they are attached. 10,000 difficulties do not make one doubt, as I understand the subject. Difficulty and doubt are incommensurate. That is, Newman wasn't so disturbed that some doctrines didn't necessarily make sense to him. He couldn't fully understand them. Why should he be disturbed by that? He didn't have to figure it all out first. Newman had learned to trust God over the course of his life, and he was humble enough and willing to be taught the truth. Faith is a matter that relates to the will, whereas understanding relates to the mind. Understanding tries to answer the question of, like, how do we know that God exists? Faith tries to answer the question of whether we love God about whether we will follow God and obey God. Our Lady teaches us the essence of faith in her fiat, her yes to God. When she received the angelic invitation to become the mother of God, she did not respond by saying, well, how do I know that God is real? Or, could you just prove to me that you're an angel first? She responded very simply, let it be to me according to your word. Doubt is not really about our challenge to understand God or even to have a knowledge of the historical facts and events of our religion. Doubt is about an unwillingness to trust God, a kind of spiritual stubbornness, an unwillingness to be taught, to learn, to grow, to have faith. What Thomas was saying on that Easter Sunday is that he was not yet Easter ready. He was unwilling to be the Apostle Thomas, sent out to the far reaches of the East to be a fisher of men for the kingdom. The truth is that none of them were Easter ready on that Easter day, but their encounters with the risen Lord made them ready. It made them apostles. And when it was Thomas's turn, it made him ready. It made Thomas burst with that awesome expression of faith, the devout hearts repeat every time they encounter the risen Lord in the elevated host at Mass, when he said, my Lord and my God. Perhaps the doubt experienced by Thomas and by all the apostles was a teaching moment and a reminder that ultimately faith is a gift from God, a gift to be received. Faith is a virtue, a good habit infused in the soul at baptism. It is our spiritual rebirth, giving us new life by connecting us with God. It opens our minds to his truth and our hearts to his will. Faith comes from God and leads us back to God. Faith is what empowers us to call Jesus Lord and Savior. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus is talking about you in the gospel. You have been given the precious gift of faith in the water of baptism. St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Faith is not of ourselves. It comes from the outside. It comes from above. And best of all, it's a gift, and it's free. On our own, we could do nothing 
to save ourselves. We need the power of God. Only He can breathe new life into the spiritually dead. Only He can raise people from their graves. Only He can bring faith to those who doubt. Thomas the doubter was really Thomas the unwilling. Does that describe you? Have you perhaps lost a little bit of your faith? Do you need to be refilled with God's grace today? Well, it can happen. And the good news is, it's still a free gift. God can soften even a stony heart and make it like Our Lady's heart, saying, let it be to me according to your word. God can enlighten the mind of the skeptic and the scoffer and help him come to the point of decision where he can say, God, I love you, even when I don't get it. God can bend even the stiff and stubborn knee and make it like that of Thomas, whose doubt vanished in the divine presence, and he testified to the truth that he was willing to receive. Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.